So let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I'm just grateful for, grateful for music, grateful for fun times, um, to the, the chance to just sing songs together. And, and now, Lord, the opportunity to, to, to do that and get to sing songs to you and invite you in to this, this chance of, of, of singing along with friends and family. Um, God, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. We, we want to say it with our words, mean it in our hearts, and, and live it out with our actions, God. But it starts here. It starts here with worshiping you, humbling ourselves before Almighty God. So we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, yeah, we'll go. We'll give some a uh, couple announcements. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. So blessed that you guys are here. It really is. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that you are the great physician, that you are able, Lord, to uh, not only love Karen in such a way that she can't even fathom, but you can guide the doctors. You can reach inside her with your own spirit, and Lord, and just knit, knit her back. Bring her back to health. Bring her back. Restore her, Lord. Allow her the grace, the beauty, the mercy to become the woman you would have her be. And God, just protect her and bring her back to us so we can all give her big hugs. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And guys, let's just keep, uh, who's coming out for prayer with Tim in the morning? Y'all coming out with prayer, right? All right, keep doing that. What, a, what better way to start off your day than to get out at 9 o'clock, come have prayer time, a little devotion. It's at that time when you come at 9 in the morning that Tim will also reaffirm what's going on for the day, um, like whether the group's at 1045 in the meeting room or it's 930 in the spiritual care office. And if we have too many in spiritual care, we just walk right through that door and we come in here. Make sense? And uh, so let's just keep uh, building the program and keep moving forward. Y'all have bonded and continue to pray for each other and um, you know when someone's in need don't wait just lay hands and pray and be there for each other this is what we're called to do to be a community and to love one another and that's part of our recovery the service serving others and loving them and blessing them and praying for them is a huge part of getting out of your own head makes sense and uh, so I just wanted to say that and continue to to support the the road to freedom and the faith program here one of the other things on my heart is um, get involved. Like, if you have the opportunity to go, to go to the Monday night Recovery Church 12-step meeting on Monday nights, get out to it. You heard those, who was at Recovery Church last night again? You heard them talking about the 12-step meeting on Monday nights. We go there. You just need to, sign, you need to get out in patient care and say, I want to go. And that's Monday nights. It's a Christ-centered 12-step meeting. There's very few and far between. And it was a great time. And of course, you know, Recovery Church, y'all had a blast with that last night. And you got Life Church on Sunday. Um, how many here are still on detox? We got one right now. Okay. Well, thank you. We're praying for you. You'll, you'll catch up. And I'm going to get back to the worship right now. We love you guys so much. Thank you. If we really believe what Jesus said, he said he's coming back. He said he's going to begin making things right right now through his Holy Spirit. For any who calls in the name of the Lord, they will be saved, and His Spirit will make His dwelling place in them. And He's at work right now, yeah. But one day, He's actually going to tear the eastern sky. He's going to come back blazing white with all the might of heaven. And He's going to restore all things. And the brokenness that we deal with in this life, addiction that we deal with in this life, won't deal with it. Mistakes that you can't really pay back in this life, they're paid for by Christ, and you won't feel that guilt anymore. And He'll make it all things, He'll make all things right. And that's what we think about. That's what happened on the cross. That's what happened in the tomb. And that's that that last verse we sang is the promise to come. And so if you really do believe that, there's so much peace to be had in casting our mind to Jesus. This Thursday, or sorry, Friday morning just looking to him and all that he's done for us all that he's accomplished for us just close your eyes and just think about that think about Jesus what have you paid for for me what sin have you paid for for me how far down in the pit did you reach to call me back to, to pull me out those intimate places of brokenness things done to us things we've done Think about the fact that Jesus thought of those things when he was hanging there on the cross, knowing what he was paying for, 
who he was buying back from sin. We get to praise his name. We get to praise the name of Jesus, the same. No praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name. Sing it out. Forevermore, for endless days, we will sing your praise. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we are so grateful that you would hear us as we sing to you, that you would listen to us when we pray to you, that you would speak to us through your word actively. God, would you bless Patrick as he preaches to us today, and would you help us to be changed? Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Nothing like making a joyful noise to the Lord, right? And I'll leave it at that. Um, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table, just so, uh, so I don't get up and don't run to it, but on the way out, make sure you guys sign out, okay? There's a sign-up sheet on the back. Again, I'm Pastor Patrick. I know most all of you. I'm going to bring a message today. Um, it, it's personal for me, and, um, and I want to share it with you guys. It means a lot, and I think hopefully uh, before the next uh, half hour is over, it'll, it'll touch your hearts as well. All right, the message today. I want to talk about coming to the table. Uh, when I preached er, and, and taught earlier in the week, I was talking about our identity. How many are in the group when I was talking about our identity? Okay, a couple. And... Um, Really, the reality of this is how we see ourselves is what we get up and we do every day, right? If I see myself, and that's sort of like what Junior was trying to talk about last night. If you see yourself as an addict, or you, know, you get up every day. If you see yourself as a failure, you get up and that's your expectation. If you see yourself as somebody who's not successful in relationships, well, you sabotage it because that's who you are. Make sense? Who and how you see yourself is what you get up and do every day. Problem is, we've been lied to our whole lives to spin off what I taught earlier on Wednesday and what Junior taught last night. We've been lied to our whole lives. We've been told that we're broken. We've been told that we're sinners. We've been told that we're not worthy. We've been told we're not worth anything. And I'm going to go off script a little bit here. Can you imagine being taught, being born? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a story about a, a, a relative of mine that lives there in Brazil, but I'll get to that in a minute. But can you imagine um, being born on the streets, living in the streets, eating out of trash cans, pickpocketing, survival, cardboard box, you know, the whole bit, right? You never knew anything else. That was your life. That's all you know. And then someone came along in that alley and looked and said, and grabbed you and said, my daughter, my son, you've been lost and now you're found. The prodigal, you've been lost and now you're found. And they brought you home to their kingdom and then sat you down at the table and you've got five rows of spoons and five rows of forks and six different cups and plates and servants you'd be freaking out you wouldn't even know you never even used a fork <laughs> do you see what I'm saying you'd be going put me back in the alley I know how to find food in the trash can do you get where I'm going with this? Why? Because it's what you know. It's what you're used to, right? And, and we fear what we don't know, even though it's our be for our best. And I, that's what happens sometimes when, when we pursue this relationship with God. We fear it because we don't know it, and what we know it is our what we know is our brokenness, and we don't know our wholeness. What we know is our unrighteousness, and we don't know righteousness. Make sense? So we literally feel fear. fear What's best? Because we don't know it. And so I'm going to enter into a message today and, and, and talk to you about that, about how God's love, and it's called Come to the Table, and your place is at God's table. Because for many of us, if we were to have a story of our life written, we would be that person in the alley. Beg, borrow, and steal, and let me tell you, your active addiction, there's much you wouldn't do. I'm not going to take the time to go through the war stories right now, but I, every one of you has a story where you betrayed someone close to you, that's for sure. I want to tell you a story today, and this goes back about uh, whew, 1,200 years B.C., over 3,000 years ago. And back then, King Saul, Saul was the king of Israel, and Saul had a son. His son was named Jonathan. Jonathan was the heir to Saul's kingdom. 
Now, Jonathan had a, had a son, and his name was Mephibosheth. I'm going to say that again. Mephibosheth. Don't say that three times fast. It's really dangerous. Okay? <laughs> so you got, you, got da, you got the granddad, you got the son, you got the grandson. Make sense? There's the lineage. There's the line of succession. Saul, the king. Jonathan, his son. Mephibosheth, the grandson. Jonathan's best friend was David. Now David was that same David that slew the, the giant. David is that same shepherd boy that was raised up to, to rule the armies and to have great conquests. David was the one who eventually became king after Saul. You see, Saul was so paranoid and so jealous, so crazy in his own desire for power that there were a period of time where he sought out to kill David just because the people loved David and he was afraid because the people loved David they would make David the king and Saul would be run out. Well ultimately that's what happened. But he actually hunted David for a period of time to kill him, to eliminate the competition, to protect the lineage. Well David becomes king and now the normal tradition, when someone becomes king that's outside the family, the normal tradition back then in almost all the cultures is you executed the whole lineage of the existing line of kings so that no one in that lineage could come back to claim their right to the throne. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's kind of crazy, but that's what they did. Let's go ahead and look at the next slide. Well, because that's the case, Mephibosheth, as a, a, a young child, knows he has to flee, and his caretaker woman takes him, and they have to flee because they have figured that David's sending soldiers to kill all of the lineage of Saul so that no one would be left because he would be the next in line for the, the kingdom um, and, and for the power and for the throne. <laughs> Mephibosheth, who we're going to call M. So M flees, but while he flees, she drops him in some way, and, and the, or stumbles, and, and down the stairs, or whatever it is, and he breaks both his feet and his legs, and he becomes crippled. So Mephibosheth is crippled, and he ends up with his caretaker in the outskirts, like in the no-man desert where it was like be the, heart, the, the badlands, you know what I'm saying? Anything to survive, he's out there hiding. David, 2 Samuel chapter 9, after he takes power in the throne, loving God, hearing God, doing God's will, letting God speak into his life with love and mercy, knowing how much God has given David mercy and love and protected him through all these years. In his heart, says to his court, is there anyone left in the lineage of Saul? Jonathan is dead. Saul is dead. But is there anyone left in their lineage? And it was found that Mephibosheth was still alive. So David sends out two guards and some, some members of his court to search out for Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Am. <laughs> well, they find him. And they bring him back to the courts in David's throne room. Now, technically, this could have been all about bringing him back so they could execute him in front of the people. That's what normally would have been done as a show of power. As so I am now claiming the throne, there's no one else. But instead, Mephibosheth says to David, I am but a dog. And he felt worthless and unworthy. I want you to know something just to keep the story in balance. The reason why David sent them out to find Mephibosheth, I'm going to give you a punchline ahead of time, wasn't to bring him back to execute him. It was to bring him back to make him a son. 
It was to bring him back to give him his father's inheritance. It was to bring him back to bless him. Just the opposite of what should have been done, which is what God does to us. Gives us grace and love and mercy instead of punishment and pain and death, which we deserve. So, Mephibosheth says, I am but a dog. I felt I am so unworthy to even be here, basically pleading for his life. And David says to Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, I'm going to give you a seat at my table, and for all of your days you shall sit at my table, and you shall dine with me at my table, and you shall have servants here at, at your side, and I'm going to give you all of your father's land, all of his cattle, and all of his servants. I'm going to give you your inheritance. Can you imagine living on the street here we are out there in active addiction doing things we never thought we'd do fearing the punishment fear fearing everything would catch up to us always looking over our shoulder the paranoia come on you know what I'm talking about the guilt eating us up the sleepless nights waking up every hour having to get medicated and I just so you didn't have to think about what it is that the vicious cycle and yet he gets called into the throne room of the king he says I love you I have no condemnation I want you to have a seat at my table I want to give you your inheritance I want to bless you with servants I want to restore you to your rightful place. I want to... <laughs> who was in the Wednesday group? We were talking about Princess Diaries. Right, 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 right. Uh, that's uh, um, Julie Andrews and uh, who was the other actress? Anne Hathaway. Okay, well, I'm not going to... We'll skip that for time's sake. So go ahead and go back. So, okay, There you go. I'm going to tell you a story about Soko Hanyo. This is a real person. Uh, my family uh, is from uh, Brazil, and uh, that's where I, I come from. My father, grandfather. Um, in the northern side of Brazil, and again, I'm going to just tell you a story real quick. Um, Brazil is huge, like the United States, you know, East Coast, West Coast, like different worlds, right? Well, same thing in Brazil, the north and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the south and the north. And the north is the Amazon. And on the mouth of the Amazon River, the mouth is a port. It's called Belém. That port is where my family's from. And so I've had the privilege of being able to visit my family in Belém many times. And, um, and they're very wealthy. Uh, there's no middle class there, truly, in the north. Uh, this goes way, way back. That you're either very, very poor and you work for those who are wealthy, and then the real poor live in the street. So the middle class would be the poor. <laughs> Does that make sense? The servants. Now. I'm not judging because my family, they're amazing and they're loving and uh, it's just the way it is. They have a compound. It's four houses and a high rise and they all live there. Aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, and the servants live in the high rise. Every house has maids, cooks, drivers, private security. Um, I, I gotta be honest with you, I really don't mind visiting there when I have my espresso waiting for me coming out of the bedroom, you know. But <laughs> that's another story. It's their life. My aunt, who's a matriarch, Nazare, she volunteers as an orphanage and she meets young kids and these young kids that are in the orphanage, they're the lucky ones because at some point they were on the street. They were born on the street. All they knew was living on the street. Uh, I mean, you can't park your car. You've got to tip people. That's just, that's the street people. That's how they make money. They're selling shrimp on the side with a grass hut. Literally, it's just the way it is. It's like Stone Age. It's, it's surreal because you've got the wealthy and you've got this people living in grass huts by the, by the river. I mean, it's, anyway, it is what it is, okay? I don't judge. But my family, again, uh, uh, aunts and uncles, doctors, lawyers, my, um, my uncle uh, is a retired admiral to the Navy, um, uh, my great-grandfather is on the Supreme Court, I mean, the very, my heritage there is very wealthy, okay? And, and again, that's not the story, I'm just trying to set it up. My uncle owns a private university, it's 20,000 students. Now, when they bring the servants into the home, 
those servants, they would also bring their family if they were a direct family, like a husband bring the wife, so on and so forth. That's why they had the high rise. They'd have their own apartments. But they all had jobs. And this is their function. That's just the way that society works. Make sense? We get up and we go to work. It's no different, except it's just self-contained. Well, I'm there. I'm going about 15 years ago. I'm there, and this little girl, Nazare brought back from the orphanage, who was born on the streets, lived on the streets. All she knew was that trash can, picking pockets, eating out of the trash can, and she was the little one. She probably got what was left over because the little ones, you know, it's survival of the fittest on the street. And then when she got into the orphanage, she was still the little one. She, got, she only got to eat what was left over, what the bigger kids got done. And now she's probably about 12 years old. And she comes in, and Azra brings her into the house. Now here's one of the things that my family does, is the, e the evening meal, the meal, which is late at night, 8 o'clock, because they do their siesta thing, it's that Latin thing. 8 o'clock meal, everybody has a seat at the table. Family and the servants. Everybody has a seat at the table. And they eat the meal together. And they become family. And if they have an aptitude, every one of the, the servitudes, of those in service, they put to school. In other words, in that society, even if, you, even if you were middle class, you couldn't get past sixth grade. That's how they separate the classes, because only people who have money are able to go to the private schools to get education to go to college. So it's education is how they use to separate the classes. Make sense? So here's Soko Heno, 12 years old, just out of the orphanage. Here she is. She's been there a couple of days. Everyone has a seat at the table, having a meal, and I'm eating the meal, and I'm looking around, and there's an empty chair. And I'm like, why is there an empty chair? And so I ask to be excused at the end of the meal, and I go into the kitchen. I kid you not, I go into the kitchen, and there's little Sukoheno. She's pulling food out of the trash and tearing it onto the counter and eating from the trash and off the counter. She had a seat at the table, but all she was used to was eating out of the trash can and the leftovers. You see, that's how she saw herself. That's who she was. That's all she knew. Make sense? Why do we do what we do? It's sometimes it's because it's all we know. And we haven't accepted who we truly are. She had a seat at the table. I went back 10 years later. Little Sokoheno had grown up. She had an aptitude. She had gifts. And my aunt and uncle put her into the university and paid for her education. And she ended up in their Juilliard School of the Arts. And when I was there 10 years later, I had the privilege of watching her be the premier soloist at the Metropolitan Opera in the city. Can you imagine? From the streets the, to taking her seat at the table, which she had to do eventually, accepting her adoption into this new family, and then being blessed and gifted and trained and fulfilling her destiny and blessing everybody with that gift. I'm talking about every one of us. God has a seat at the table for every one of us. Why haven't we taken it? What are we afraid of? Well, it's better back in the streets. I, I, I'm used to eating out of the trash can. I'm not worthy. You see, her life changed when she took her seat. Her life changed when she took her seat. Next slide. The Bible says that we've been adopted as God's children. We are children and we are heirs. When I come to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, the Bible says that God adopts you. He seals you with the Holy Spirit. He calls you into his family to take a seat at the table. 
Do you know as his child, as a co-heir with Jesus Christ, do you know that you have the authority in the signet ring of the Father? The same thing in the prodigal, that signet ring of the Father and the robe of righteousness, and you sit at his table, and the angels serve you in God's will. Not mine, but his. When we say, I turn my will and life over to the care of God, and we come in oneness with that, and God's purpose for our life, we move angels. They serve. Do you even know that's who you are? And that's the place that God has given you as his child? And the authority? We are no longer slaves, but we're children. And we're appointed to be heirs. I think that speaks a whole lot of Sonia Haniel's life. She wasn't a slave. She was given a chance to be the person God created her to be. And God wants every one of you in this room to take your place at his table, to read his word, to show up, take your seat. Let him fill you with the truth. Seek him. Let him feed you, guide you, lead you into a new life. She had to take that seat and she had to surrender to it. Accept the blessings. Mephibosheth had to take his seat at the table. He had to accept the blessings and the inheritance. That's my prayer for everyone in this room today. God has your seat. He has your seat. It's waiting for you. Take it. No matter how uncomfortable it is to open the word in the morning and to pray. No matter how uncomfortable it is to memorize a verse, no matter how uncomfortable it is to pray for your enemies and bless those that would curse you, no matter how hard it is not to judge somebody, but pray and bless and ask the Holy Spirit to do what he does. Jesus said, I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table and sit on its thrones judging the tribes of Israel. I think that's a pretty high command. <laughs> Take a moment and meditate on that verse for a second. Jesus is assigning you, those who belong to him, as God assigned to Jesus. As Jesus is in the Father, so we are in him. The kingdom, as heirs, that we may eat and drink at the table. His word his spirit, his life. That's what you eat and drink. So that Israel one day will see the truth in Jesus as his Messiah. How many here want to take that seat? He's calling you. But what does the seat at the table mean? That means I eat my meals there? I fellowship there? I play games there? I have fun there? I build relationships there? How many things happen around a healthy table in a home? In a healthy home? Sit in your seat and pray and read the word. Make that your spiritual meals. We're so worried about how we look and what's going on in the physical world. This seed is spiritual. How much time and attention are we giving to sitting at that table spiritually? In proportion to the time that we spend worrying about this physical world. If it were truly a spiritual thing, then I would be having my meals there every day and I would be fellowshipping there every day and I would be spending time with Jesus there every day and I would be having this angel serve me and pray and blessings and send them out and let God be God and take his word and it's the bread of life, it's the meat, it's the milk, it's the water, it's the substance of my spirit and I would feast on that word morning, noon and night like meals. Even if it's nothing more than writing a couple scriptures on an index card and feeding off that snack all day. 
take your seat at the table. Become the men and women God called you to be. It isn't going to happen eating out of trash cans and doing the same old, same old. It's going to happen just like Mephibosheth when you take your seat. And Jesus has a seat at his table. Come, will you? Come and take that seat. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the message. I thank you, Lord, that everyone here, Lord, can choose to surrender to you, accept their place, come to you on their knees, be welcomed into your arms, and sit at your table. Every time we open your word, we're sitting at your table. Every time we're, God, we're conscious of you, Father, we're fellowshipping with you at your table. Every time, Lord, two or more are gathered and we invite you, Father, into the conversation, we are talking over your table. God, let us know that we don't have to go back to be fed by the TV, fed by the media, fed by false doctrine, fed by the lies of this world. But truly, Lord, we can know that truth and that truth will set us free at your table. Give us that discipline and desire to keep coming back to the buffet of your life. Spiritually, Father, allow us to see the importance that this physical world will come and go. But the spirit you want to grow up inside me is eternal. Let me pay attention to it and focus on it as I take my place at your table. In Jesus' name, amen.